Hello viewers, wherever you're watching us from, welcome to another edition of your weekly State of Affairs program here on QTV. I'm your host, Aleo Sise, with my co-host, Sidi Sise. Sidi. Thank you very much, Aleo. Well, viewers, today we are joined by uh, a renowned politician, Bakari Bunja Dabo, formerly known as Bibi, a former vice president and finance minister under the then PPP government. He had also briefly served under the then AFPRC regime before quitting and moving to the UK. He returned to the country in 2017 after a change of government. Mr. Bibi, thank you so much for being on the program. My pleasure. Uh, I've been here a couple of times before, and on each of those occasions, the experience left me with uh, a lot of positive feeling. So I'm happy to be back. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for being on the program once again. Uh, we are first approaching uh, to the elections. Uh, will you be contesting in the in the next election? But before then. Uh, could you just share with us why forming your own party and not uh, just being part of the PPP? Oh, well, uh, if you wish, I can start with the latter part of the question, which you want me to start with. Yeah. Well, you form your own party uh, when you believe that the ideas you have, the principles uh, you stand for, for your country, are not... Um, are not uh, promoted to your satisfaction by existing existing parties. Otherwise, if uh, you subscribe entirely to their own policies and principles, then there is no point for me on party. You better go and join forces with them. But uh, in my own case, and it was not just me, it was a number of uh, others with me, we felt at the time that uh, the parties that were existing then, uh, including the PPP, didn't uh, meet uh, what we considered the right type of ideas and, and policies that our country needs. And therefore, we created our own platform to propagate those policies and, and, uh, and programs. That's the reason why. Um, now, this, this, I need a reminder about the earlier part of your question. I mean, will you be contesting? Will you be contesting ah, uh, yes, in the yes. next election as, of course, the, the leader <coughs> of the Gambia for All Party? Yes, well, um, I have to explain this to you. The uh, Gambia for All uh, is a registered party, and we are busy trying to uh, implant ourselves countrywide. And suddenly, as a political party, we are created for the purpose of trying to take part in the leadership of the country uh, and therefore um, with the approaching elections we are watching with a lot of interest but technically before we get to uh, offer ourselves as as participant or contestant in those elections we have some steps to go through and those are not yet done so we'll have to wait until we cross those bridges um, once we cross those bridges and it's decided that the Gambia for all will contest the elections. Then the second question will be who will be the flag bearer. So it's quite a, a long way for us. But we are in the field, we are active, and we are, and we are aware that there are elections coming in December. And we are trying as best as possible to put ourselves in a position where if decision is taken to contest the elections, we should be able to do so. How soon do you think you will finalize this thing? Oh, well, this will spread certainly over the coming weeks and months because uh, if the elections are in December, you will have to settle such issues uh, at least a month or two before. You know, this is, uh, this is the normal kind of uh, thing for, for a party like ours. Well, the voter registration has just concluded and in a recent paper uh, released by your party after your central committee's meeting held in Bacau, mm -hmm. you, you said, and I quote, the confusion surrounding the voter registration process what did you mean by that? Oh, well, we are referring to the, the image or the pictures uh, coming from widely uh, uh, fielded reports, reports by, uh, from different sources. There were reports by independent media reporting uh, sometimes as much as confusion, conflict at the uh, registration site. There are also reports fielded by our own observers and as well as observers for the political parties. Uh, put together, really, they give the impression of uh, 
not the perfect orderly kind of registration that we consider desirable. And that's one of the things that were deplored in the, in the press release referred to when our central committee met and in, in, in reviewing the situation in the country, uh, took off time to look at the registration process which, is, which was going, which is still going. So it is not a, uh, a definitive conclusion we have come to, but we certainly have cause to feel concerned based on the reports that are reaching us, uh, suggesting a number of uh, uh, malfunctioning of the system, including also uh, reports of things that look very suspicious, uh, including uh, reports of incidents, including even violence, verbal violence, physical violence. These are all uh, things that took part, uh, that took place in the context of the the um, registration process, and they are not reassuring. Those ones give you concern. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dabo. Uh, just to follow up on that uh, answer, uh, was it so significant to undermine the integrity, the credibility of the process? This some of the you know the facts that you put across here. Well, we have to have a, a complete uh, report and analyze those reports. So far, there is, they give cause for concern, but I, whether they, they, are, they, they, are, they, are, they are sufficiently grave and of the scale that can undermine what you call the integrity, I think one has to wait for a little bit to see because some of the issues are already, uh, they've been subject of uh, uh, contention in the courts and uh, the courts have made a ruling. We want to see how the electoral uh, authorities uh, act on those rulings and see. So for now, we, we cannot say that the integrity of the process is compromised, but we can say it is threatened. So are you, you know, putting together a, a formal report that you would either hand over to the electoral body? No, well, we are, we are reviewing. We are reviewing once the the uh, the the lists are published and we'll we'll take a look at those lists and take study them con together with the reports that we got from our observers it is ba uh, based on that that will come to form an opinion as to <coughs> the uh, the reliability the reliability of the process and, uh, and 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 it's only then that we can say that uh, the process has been compromised or it's not been compromised uh, thank you very much. Um, Gambia in the diaspora uh, voting has been an issue uh, in the you know, of re recent. You talked about apparent refusal of the IEC and the government of the Gambia to implement the Supreme Court's decision that Gambians in the diaspora have a right to be registered to vote. What's your evidence for this apparent refusal? My reason. Yes, you, you <laughs> said about uh, apparent refusal yes, by yes, the IEC yes, yes, and the government yes, of the yes. Gambia. Yes. Well, you know, um, this is a, an issue which has been agitated in the courts. And I myself, in my personal capacity, happen to be party to the action that was brought to the courts that yes. led to the ruling uh, by, the, by the Supreme Court at the time. In fact, the Supreme Court didn't, uh, in my opinion, didn't uh, kind of uh, break if any new ground. What it did say that is that they are, they are, the fact that they weren't enabled to, to vote mm -hmm. was wrong. That, that strictly speaking, they should be enabled to vote. So in other words, even all along, the right was there. And the Supreme Court just acknowledged that by the executive, including the election authorities, not in the past allowing, making arrangements, administrative arrangements for them to participate, they have been doing what is, what is unlawful. Uh, that is the meaning of that that uh, that, uh, that ruling. Now, it's very important an issue because one is not only the number numbers involved, and there are quite a significant proportion of the population that are fall within the diaspora. But there is also the very principle that uh, voting for your country is the is a very important civic right and responsibility. And in a democracy, in a really healthy democracy, everything should be made, every attempt should be made by the state to enable people to exercise that. That distance must not be used as an excuse to deprive them of that right. So it is extremely important. 
But um, beyond that, the whole matter now because has taken on a completely different dimension. From the point, from the moment that the court made a ruling, it made it doubly uh, incumbent on the on the on the on the, um, the, the executive, including the uh, independent electoral commission, to, to implement it and to ignore it, appear to ignore it, and, and, and uh, which we, what I refer to then as apparent now is almost confirmed. That is a very, very serious thing for our democracy and the rule of law. I mean, this is very serious. I mean, uh, it was almost uh, two weeks ago that we heard of a, a former president of South Africa taken to court for not, for not, for, not uh, for, for showing contempt for the court. Okay. What the, the attitude that's taken by the government over this matter and the and the uh, IEC uh, arguably can be contemptuous of of the court. Of course, I expect that they will try to come. So are you, with, are you with saying the IEC, the electoral body, and the government are in goals you know, as far as this is concerned? Well, I mean, when I say IEC, because the, the 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 government, including the president, is responsible for making institutions work. The IEC is supposed to be an independent institution, but it is also supposed to be made to work by the government, by the president. <laughs> All the more so since in our own laws, the IEC entire membership is elected by the president. They are his, his servants, more or less, even though the commission is said to be independent. But in any case, even if they are not independent, just like the, 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 the uh, president cannot remain indifferent if the courts okay. don't do it. He, he has a responsibility to tell them, look, do your, court, do your job. So, 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 so but are you questioning the, the integrity of the IEC? No, I'm not saying so. Okay. I'm saying that uh, uh, this is a case which uh, is very disturbing okay. for, a, for a, the democratic order that we want to encourage in this country, in which uh, there is not only separation of powers, but there is the uh, respect for court rulings by the executive, setting a good example. By, uh, by ignoring, because that's the least one can say, they are, they are ignoring this thing. They are, they are setting a very bad example for, for, for this vital principle uh, for an effective democracy where there are checks and balances. Mm -hmm. So it's very threatening. And I'm saying that uh, in other countries, equally mm -hmm. young democracies like us, we have seen people sent to jail for, for this kind of thing. So it's very sad that this time it is authorities themselves who are, who are making themselves uh, arguably guilty of a contemptuous uh, attitude towards a ruling. Which is but, very but, sad. Uh, but how do you respond to those who said uh, without the, uh, the infrastructure, the personnel, the technology, mm -hmm. no amount of will can, can really make this thing happen? That's well, what I'm voting well, 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 look, that is, the, that is, a, that is a, an operational challenge. And that's why a whole administrative uh, an institutional structure called the IEC is put in place. These are challenges for which it is supposed to work out ways around them. I'm not sure it is a technological issue, but whatever the challenge is, you are supposed to make it happen. Work around uh, obstacles and, and challenges. You don't give up, fold your hands uh, in because you have met challenges, particularly when it's a question of fundamental rights of citizens. It's too important an issue to give, use that as an excuse and say, oh, we don't have this. No, no, it is for them. They don't have the money. It is their problem. It's supposed to, the, the IEC is supposed to be funded by the, by the authorities from the, from the public funds, from our taxpayers' money. That's their responsibility. They're supposed to do it. If they have done that, this other management operation, that's IEC doing it. If the, the present commission in its membership cannot do it, let them get them out and get other people there. It has to be done. But Mr. Dabo, why do you think the government and perhaps the IEC are not willing to have a diaspora? I wouldn't want to speculate. <laughs> I wouldn't want to speculate. I only find that attitude irresponsible, that's all. But I don't want to speculate as to why. That is up to anybody's guess. But now, moving forward, uh, how do you see the, the, the current political landscape in the country? Well, we are in pre-campaign pre uh, period, and obviously the, la the landscape is uh, quite agitated, uh, also very mobile and dynamic in the sense that there is room and scope for a lot of changes. Um, all what I would deplore is the, 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 the violence that is creeping into 
the, uh, the politics uh, at this stage, violence, not only physical, but vi uh, verbal violence that we see. That's very deplorable. But otherwise, I think it's normal that uh, six months or three months of elections time, there should be some agitation in the, in the political landscape. And there should also be this mobility because that speaks to the vibrancy of our democracy. If, if things are static, uh, people are just there is no movement from one party to the other you know, then it's not it's not a sign of a, a very healthy democracy but wasn't this the case in, in our politics the violence you're talking about was it wasn't it the case in our politics was it not the case in our politics yeah uh or it's just it? happening now oh well under the under the uh, 22 year old dict dictatorship it was a comp it was a different uh, it was a different environment uh yes there were uh, attempts, people, parties registered, and there was competitive, if you like, uh, elections. But we knew very well that um, the atmosphere was such that it was not a, uh, uh, it lacked vibrancy. It was almost a foregone conclusion that uh, the 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 uh, authorities uh, then in control of the country were not allowing for uh, free and, and, and clean competition. So it's a uh, in that regard, it's, it, it's what we have today is different from what obtained before. But what, what, what do you think has actually caused this thing that, you, that you're raising here? What? The environmental languages you are talking about, the violence, the ethnics, you know. Or oh, what caused it? Yeah. Well, um, it's sad. I mean, firstly, uh, I think our society itself has to be blamed. Uh, our politics mirrors our society. Uh, because in politics at that level is about how people comport themselves. And they comport themselves in terms of practices, things they learn from their society. Uh, I think uh, violence, particularly verbal violence, unfortunately, is uh, too frequent and too, you know, in our, in our, you know, it, it's regrettable. Uh, and when we come into party politics, you find it easy for people to resort to it. But that, having said that, that's not enough. I think there is also uh, indicative of bankruptcy of political ideas, because particularly at the leadership level, where the leadership has something to say, where they are not, they are not, they've got ideas to say, that's the kind of uh, direction in which they will help to orient the political discourse and move it away from a situation where people use their energies to to use uh, insults, which lead sometimes to physical violence. Uh, I think the political class uh, largely hasn't uh, shown itself to be sufficiently uh, fertile with political, with good ideas, but society it also hasn't helped. It has really allowed certain things, which you don't find in, in some other societies. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Dabo. Um, I just, uh, uh, of late, you issued a press release and where you talked about uh, inflammatory language insults, um, ethnic groups and stuff. Um, you see the deterioration not only in the political discourse, but also in the state of governance. Can you elaborate more on that? So you're not only talking about what is happening in the political discourse. Mm -hmm. You also talked about mm -hmm. uh, the state of governance as well. Yes, yes. Indeed, uh, indeed in our statement, we did say, we did, uh, as I said, it was a general review of the state of uh, affairs in the country. Yes, and in the domain of uh, governance, we we highlighted concerns. Well, that wasn't the first time we've been doing it. We've seen uh, in the area of governance uh, over the five years that this present administration, transitional government, we've seen, um, we've experienced a lot of uh, disappointment. We had very high hopes that um, things had fallen to such a low level under the dictatorship and the people have also made it clear when they voted that they voted for a change a change firstly in the governance the way the country is governed uh, in terms of the state and its institutions in terms of its pr processes and its practices so that we expected that this government would make it a priority to embark on a large scale uh, reform uh, of institutions, but also of systems. <laughs> and now, five years down the line, we have been quite disappointed by the, when we look at the scorecard in terms of real changes that need to be brought to the system. Uh, and 
And unfortunately, it didn't stop there. Uh, there is in, there are also the negative side, uh, which we deplored under the dictatorship, which we see continuing. Uh, and by that I mean the corruption, the malfe administrative malfeasance, the, the uh, poor quality of uh, service delivery to the public. These are things that are uh, where the situation, when you look at it, it, seems to register no progress. On the contrary, sometimes it appears that it's even worse. So you talk when, about disappointment, but what's your biggest disappointment so far? Oh, well, that's what I'm saying. The overall governance uh, uh, score has not been good because the, it hasn't, on the positive side, carried out the reforms that are necessary. They are not necessary only you know, because I single say, out they are not, no, they are not only necessary because I say so, but because this is what the people wanted. Yeah, yeah. Uh, even the coalition, even the coalition, even the coalition uh, administration committed itself to an agenda of reforms, an agenda of reforms. As I said, this should cut across many, many areas. First, the, the fundamental uh, functioning of the state, fundamental institutions. The reform part of it was supposed to be underpinned by a new constitution. The new constitution, which if you remember the draft, made certain significant, proposed certain significant uh, shifts from the way the, the three arms of the government, you know, uh, will interact, given more, and for the first time, uh, providing for more oversight by the legislature over some, some actions by the executive. But also in the area of civil liberties, it provided for considerable improvements. And these are all things that will have made for a better political governance. So, so uh, these are all ex expectations. Then you go to the institutions whether it's the security institutions, whether it's the civil service. These are all in, 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 in advanced state of decay. We know it. They are in advanced state of decay. And we had thought that by now the government would have had taken, the, not simply laid the foundation stone five years, a long time. We should have really uh, seen those points on a new footing. You the civil about service the dynam in dynamics of democracy, but the draft constitution was taken to the National Assembly. Yes, and yes, yes. It yes. was the practice of democracy yes, yes, that yes, it was yes, rejected. Yes, 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 that's true. I mean, that's true. Can you blame the government for that? Well, to, to some extent, yes. I mean, because let, let's face it, yes, it is the it is the at the parliament level that the the draft bill didn't uh, proceed further. But deep down, really, um, I do not see what happened as an exercise of independence by the legislative arm of the government. On the contrary, I see it as a, an instance of abusive party system, whereby parties with members in parliament were pulling the strings. This is the fact. This is the fact. So they you were, mean partisan politics have ruined it, the whole process? No, no. I'm saying that, you know, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a well-balanced democracy, the institution of parliament is are supposed to have its own integrity. And when they go there, they're supposed to debate. They are deputies of the people. They are supposed to go in there and look at the national interest. But when they are there and they are circumstances are such that they, they, they have a particular party agenda they want to forward, promote, well, that, that is really what has brought the world. And they, to the extent, yeah. then to the extent that a number of the MPs belong to parties that are in the government. In fact, they are all in the, in the, trans, in the transitional government because transitional government is a coalition government. So it's there in themselves who have put their own, their own MPs in and still now pull the strings behind to make them do what they wanted them to do. But, but that's party politics. They're in there. You know, they belong to political parties. But yes. you did make a, a statement. I think um, one need to get into, to interrogate that more. Are you questioning the integrity of the National Assembly? No, I think you're too prone to bring it, everything down to integrity. It's not a question of integrity. But certainly they have not uh, lived up to, to the expectations. Of my expectations and the expectations of many people on, a, on an issue like this. I mean, they are given a draft of a constitution. They can amend it if they want to. But to block it from going forward, it's not, an, it's not, a, that's not, a, it's not a positive thing at all. And they blocked it because they are masters behind by pulling the strings. This is the fact. Okay. Well, well, you talk about the issue of corruption. I mean, I know viewers, some people will be asking, but here is Baby Dabo who had served in a government that has been accused of being corrupt. How do you yeah. respond? 
That is true, but you need to also ask yourself who the accusers were, who the chief accusers were. The government you referred to has uh, been in charge of the stewardship of this country for something like 30 years. Uh, and I think it's a record of performance by all objective standards speaks very high. You can never say there is no instance of corruption, but it is not of the scale or the gravity coming anywhere near what, what was being made out in those uh, accusations. And that's why it's important to know who is accusing. Who is accusing? Who, was the, who were the ones doing the accusing? They are, these are people who have committed treasonable acts. They have de derailed the whole national development agenda of the, of the country. And of course, they have to try to justify themselves. <laughs> they come with these allegations. The narrative changed. Initially, they, you heard them say, oh, some soldiers went to peacekeeping duties. They were, their monies weren't paid. Later on, they shifted. They said, oh, no, no, it's corruption. Another time, they shifted. Oh, no, no, it's a slow pace of development. These are people. These are, you look at those. Well, 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 and well, in any case, <laughs> and in any case, even when they did those allegations, uh, made those allegations, they should prove it in, a, in an independent, credible manner. And they didn't. They set up commissions of inquiries, which are just kangaroo processes. It's so ridiculous that nobody should take that seriously. Well, last year, so, last so, year. So the, the government I, ref, I served into which you referred is very proud of its uh, record. And I don't think this allegation of corruption sticks to us in the eyes of any objective, serious observer. But if people want to be cynical, people want to be detractors, they will say so. But there is no, there is no, no basis. We had, we operated a responsible system, a responsible system for running a government of integrity. Those who fell foul usually are caught by the cost, forced by the auditors. Then if they are caught by the auditors, the matter is looked at whether it has a, any smell of criminality. If it does, it goes to the police, it goes to the prosecutors, and it goes to an independent, uh, an independent uh, justice. Now, that could be, that process could appear slow to some people, but that we are bound to do, because we say also a country which is governed by the laws. So that was what happened. And there were also cases where these auditors said something is wrong. Maybe you or me might feel that, oh, somebody should go to jail. Well, we didn't, because when we studied it, we knew, knowing the technicalities, the, the technical uh, criteria by which cases are won in court, that they, don't meet, that they didn't meet those criteria, we wouldn't bother taking them to court. And that led to some people uh, giving the, uh, having the impression that, no, we are, we are turning a, a blind eye. But there was no, no tolerance of impunity in the, in the system that operated. Well, th th that leads me to the next question. Last year, you said, and I quote, the actions of the current government, that's the current virus government, suggest nothing but lip services to the real transformational goal set out in the coalition agenda. If anything, the effect of the authorities' actions and omissions merely appears to compound the institutional weaknesses as well as the culture of corruption and official malpractices that have so long blighted our prospects as an entity which appears to be called a respectable nation state. Yes. This is exactly what I've been saying here. You repeat it. I how will you, I, how will I, you I fight this thing now? I if, confirm it. How I, will you I fight, still stand by that. Pardon? How, how will you fight the things you are claiming here if, if, you, are, if you win in, in, in the next election? Oh, well, we will have zero tolerance for, 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 um, for corruption. But first, one first thing we will do is to avoid making fighting corruption a political issue like the dictatorship did it. We will take it very seriously. We will recognize the context within which, you, which we work, which is that things have to be done according to the law. To the extent that the law allows, we will apply it to fight corruption. But beyond that, in, a, in the most positive side, on the preventive side, we will get our institutions also to be more efficient. Some of, some of the corruption, corruption is facilitated because the institutions are weak in capacity, both from the accounting uh, point of view to the uh, to the uh, police investigation. So we'll be addressing the, the, the issue of capacity as one of the weapons for helping us uh, improve the, the fight against corruption. But also where we have cases, we will not hesitate taking them, but we will only do it in, within the parameters of the law. 
you will not hear the NIA pick anybody on the roads, take them to mile two, even though there, there is no, 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 no case established again. We will walk it, we will fight corruption. But most importantly, or perhaps not most importantly, but number one, we will rule by example. In matters of corruption, the, 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 the example, the personal example of the leaders tells a lot. If the, if the leadership, starting from the very apex, you know, conduct, conduct itself in such a way that it, it even as much as sustains the perception <laughs> that there is uh, corruption going on, it encourages them. So that is one of the first things we'll have to tackle. Personal example, to get, set a good personal example. In addition, we will fight it as effectively as possible through improved capacity within the government uh, machinery, whether it's the investigative part, the accounting, the auditing, will all have to be strengthened. Thirdly, we will use the law uh, because we don't want to do arbitrary things. We'll do, use the law, but use the law effectively. If need be, we'll strengthen the law. And uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, interesting experiences around, even in the African region, which we know of, which we can uh, draw inspiration from and adapt them. Okay. But we will, first of all, have the will to fight corruption, set good personal example. Okay. Thank and you so much, Mr. Dabo. Thank you so much. We'll just yeah. go with a sort of commercial break. Well, viewers, you reminded you're watching State of Affairs here on QTV. I'm your host, Aliu Sise, with my co-host, Sidi Sise. And our guest tonight is uh, Bakari, Bunja, uh, Bakari Bunja Dabo, uh, fondly known as BB Dabo, the leader of the Gambia for All Party. We'll go with a sort of commercial break. And when we return, the discussion continues. Well, viewers, welcome back from the commercial break. Once again, you reminded that you're watching State of Affairs here on QTV. I am Alu Sise, and with my co-host, Sidi Sise, and our guest is uh, Bakari Dabo, uh, commonly known as Bibi, uh, the leader of the Gambia for All Party. Uh, before we go on the break, we, we are still talking about the issue of the corruption. I guess Sidi had a question that yes, he wanted to um, ask. Yes, Mr. Dabo, you talked about taking personal e example, the leadership, uh, strengthening the judiciary, strengthening the auditing, the accounting, great. Um, I think we need to go more than that. Bec what we need to know the actions actually that you may take to put a halt uh, to corruption. Because what you are saying right now is actually what is happening. The judiciary is there. The, we have the National Audit uh, Bureau. We have the Accountant General's uh, Office, the National Audit, and all these things are here. But we still have seen report of late saying corruption is, is, is well, a big problem. Me, it's a cancer. Allow right me now. to disagree with the interpretation that you put on what I said. I think okay. I've said more than that. Uh, I've said that fighting corruption is fundamentally, first, a question of will. The will okay. has to be there. Two, the leadership has to make sure that their own personal uh, example is worth, uh, it, it serves the, f the fight combating it. The, and the, the reverse side of it, when the leadership's personal uh, example is not elevating, then of course it makes it difficult. Thirdly, it uh -huh. thirdly, I said combating uh, uh, com uh, corruption as a, as a, by its nature of its phenomenon is an issue of capacity within the system. Okay. And that particularly is focused on the government's accounting system, auditing system, uh, police investigation system. So I'm saying that those are areas that, as a matter of priority, Gambia for All will strengthen them because we know that they are presently weak, very weak. Then I say, as a last resort or a last in the series, I will also see through that cases that uh, smack of criminality are taken to our courts and they are dealt with. But there, I only assure that there will be no arbitrariness. We will not do it arbitrarily. We will go through the courts, and the courts decide. It you talk about so, so that is not personal a example of a leader yes. or the leadership. Yes, yes. Can you elaborate on that? Well, I mean, personal, uh, comp uh, personal example. I mean, if uh, 
if 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 if, if uh, uh, and, and, uh, what's it called uh, a, stand, a scandal breaks out which has even become public knowledge that fertilizer meant for gambian farmers is taken from a store in jara soma and is found its way into senegal and is caught and brought back five years up until now and in that scandal in this narrative many names of ministers and permanent secretaries are uh, mentioned nothing comes out of it or mm -hmm. nothing seems to come out of it even the permanent secretary who was supposed to have been charged is back at work if there is a uh, fairly uh, uh, well, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't even want to pass pa uh, value judgment, but anyway, a report has come out of a major scandal at the fisheries department. It's going to two years now. You haven't done anything about it. And it, again, in that in the narrative there, it talks about the very senior people, the very part of the leadership. T tourism, almost every sector, you we do hear about this. Exam that means a very bad example is being set, particularly in the perception. In contrast, under the government in which I served, there have been many instances of ministers being sacked on the strength of this kind of reporting coming forward. I don't even want to name uh, names, but I, I personally was aware of many of them. Just at the whiff of, uh, of uh, scandal or something like that, the minister gets uh, sacked or the... Uh, well, we, we, we've seen uh, four so, years... So, so that is what I mean yeah. by good leadership being set as one of the key things if you really are serious about combating election uh, uh, that, 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 that is understood uh, we've seen uh, four years to five years now mm -hmm. since the transitional government has yes, been in office yes. we have not seen the anti-corruption legislature being in place would your government no, bring no, that no, up no, no, what is not in place is the proposed anti-corruption commission but yeah. there is legis there is legislation against administrative malpractice there's a whole arsenal of it even under the ppp government we had the criminal act, criminal code, the special criminal code, and all, all those legislations are there. So that's not a lack of law. The what is intended, we hope, when the corruption anti-corruption commission comes, is maybe have it in a, 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 a better institutional framework. Maybe make it more. But already, it's not lack of laws that is uh, stopping uh, action being taken. There are a lot of laws always. Yeah. Well. Uh from from corruption, we move to the uh, the obvious, the COVID nineteen pandemic. Do you have any recovery plan? <laughs> well, I, I it's difficult. This is a very complex phenomenon, uh, and I will not stand here and talk about a recovery plan which I have. But I certainly would recognize that this is <coughs> number one challenge uh, that any government, whether you are right now in force or just coming in, have to really uh, need to take tackle uh, very, very seriously and very comprehensively. First, as a public health issue, but secondly, in terms of its impact on the economy and other aspects of life, which need to be given help to recover. Now, yes, you will, will have to draw up a plan for recovery, but don't ask me because I haven't got the plan yet. You have to, you have to, because okay. that is something that you can only meaningfully do when you are already, when you are already there and the, and in the situation is on you. But are you satisfied with the way the government is responding to the pandemic? No, I have some dissatisfaction there. Uh, right from the word go, I found the government not sufficiently uh, transparent in the way they approach the, the resistance to, to the COVID. Right from the word go, in many countries faced with this kind of situation, what they do is that they, they, they evolve and encourage a consensual approach, whereby the government, but also other uh, other forces in the country, being whether political parties or civil society institutions, are encouraged to work together in a, in a, in a, in at some level, whereby they are fully in involved, fully informed of what is going on. And this, not only Gambia Fall, but others have suggested that to the Gambia, this guy hasn't. They still work within their own uh, government machinery. Uh, there is, uh, as a result, the the, the, the the transparency that needs to be there is not is not is not seen. Secondly, there appears to be, uh, unfortunately, uh, almost complete demobilization of efforts uh, since since January, February. Uh, we, we need to wait. We had to wait until the, the current uh, third or second wave had hit us, till we start we start wake, wake, waking up. And waking up, we are now told even basic things like. Uh, uh, oxygen supply is, is, is inadequate, and, and so many others. Now, 
this is a big problem. It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's understandable that when it hit us, uh, we didn't have the vaccines and that we should expect uh, through international cooperation, donation of welcome. But basic, all the basic things, all the basic inputs, I think the government should have them in place. So I'm not quite happy with the way they are handling this. Uh, this One, because the lack of inclusiveness in their approach. Two, there seems to be, they've taken a very relaxed attitude since, uh, since January, and now we are hit with the second wave, and here we are, uh, things as basic as oxygen gets, gets short. Uh, if there's a third aspect which I'm not happy with, is their whole communication around the subject. It is not effective. It is not effective because the popular participation in, 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 in actions that the government lays down uh, necessary, but it has to be motivated. And the tool for motivating is the governmental communication. If the communication is effective, you don't, you 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 will not, uh, you will find a way of overcoming this kind of uh, uh, hesitation. People not even coming forward to take vaccination. Uh, yes, it is the people who have not shown the the right kind of uh, uh, enthusiasm to help themselves. But still, it is this government's role to motivate them by communicating appropriately and effectively to get them to, to, to cooperate better. So there are a number of uh, points over which I'm not quite happy. So in a nutshell, you're saying the government is incompetent? No, I'm not, com com I'm not coming to that conclusion. I've just said what I said, that you ask me whether I... <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, yes. Another concern, uh, Mr. Dabo, is the high cost of living uh, many Gambians are really having now. Uh, you were a former minister of finance. What do you think is the reason for the frequent price increases in essential commodities and how do you think we deal with them again when you talk about high cost of living we talk about a housing crisis we talk about land crisis all these are part of our today reality what do we do to get ourselves out of i would call it a mess yeah well i i could try to distinguish the cost of living uh, problem from the housing and land things and maybe deal with them separately yeah, absolutely. to yeah. confuse them. Now, uh, cost of living, you take into account um, basic things like what people need to, for, for their living, uh, including, of course, uh, accommodation and transport, but more, most importantly, what they eat. Now, we are in a situation where we depend a lot for our feeding on what we import. And unfortunately, the imports, um, the, the, the price of imports is not a factor that is controlled domestically. I would not come and play cheap politics here, tell you uh, Gambia for all will bring the bag of rice, price of bag of rice to 600 or 300. I know because it wouldn't fall within my hands. Maybe the most I can do is a little customs duty that is added, I can say, reduce that or take it off. But even that will not make that big of a big difference. But what I think uh, makes our situation difficult is that rice, uh, the, the sky, the, the, the hike in, in imported goods is coinciding with uh, a drop in incomes in the country. Incomes continue to drop, not only the paid uh, workers, but people in the production like agriculture and fisheries and animal husbandry, these are all sectors that have collapsed. They have collapsed. Where the, what, the, what the farmers used to get before, if you cons uh, just look at the production. So their, their incomes have gone down at a time but what they eat, which is imported, is going up. So that is what is making worse. And I think a serious, honest government to, should talk about increasing productivity, increasing farmers' incomes, increasing the, the Gambians so that they can put themselves in a better position to deal with increases in imported uh, commodities that they need. Of course, there are others that are uh, uh, produced locally where, again, if you increase production, maybe the, 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 the demand uh, will be, the supply will such that the prices can come down. I think these are things government's economic policy can play a big role in improving it, but not through false promises like we'll bring the price of rice down. We cannot. The price, we don't grow the rice. The price, the, price, the price of rice is something we import it with, and we have to accept it. But we have to help Gambians' incomes to go up. 
where incomes remain depressed and continue to fall, well, of course, people will suffer. Just before you go to the, the second question, how do you increase productivity? Because you talk about increasing productivity. Yeah. And then the demand? Yeah. Would, 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 well, would productivity, is, it boils down to, in our case, investment. Our agriculture has uh, uh, gone down, where if you take uh, uh, groundnuts, for example, uh, groundnut production, which was less than even 30,000 under the colonial regime, had through the policy of uh, 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 investment and, and providing incentives, had gone up to 140,000 tons per annum. Now it's, it's, it doesn't even get to 20,000. That is a disaster which has happened to this country. And this is the country, this is the, uh, the industry which occupies 75 percent of the population. Their product, production dropped from 140,000 tons in terms of groundnuts. And similarly for rice also and for other agricultural crops. This is the thing. And that happened because investment which help boost it before was was pulled down the investment was in there you look at the budget after year after year between 1994 and now see how much goes into agriculture on the paper and that's even different from what goes on because again the order the order canker comes in that is the embezzlement and the corruption what is put on paper is not the far from what actually reaches the the farmers but the 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 the, 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 the bottom line is that the investment that reaches the farmer has gone down considerably and the farmers tell you that. I have been around the country, they tell you. They remember what it used to be in the past, what assistance they had, whether in terms of inputs like fertilizer, uh, uh, seeds, not only the, the volume, but the timeliness and the quality uh, extension help they had. These are the things that combined with their own hard work that raised the, the, producti the productivity and with it, of course, their incomes. When you talk about investment, it must be conducive, the environment. Right now, how would you say? I, you know, I'm, I'm how, talking particularly of... How would you characterize the investment I'm, now I'm, in the Gambia? No, I'm coming uh, to you. Yeah. you. You're getting me wrong there. I'm, I'm talking even more of public investment in this okay. case, not private investment. Okay. From, the budget, from the budget. From the budget. There is the famous uh, Maputo uh, agreement in which African gov governments committed themselves to invest at least 10% of their annual, annual budget. budget in agriculture. Of course, hardly any African government respects that. But when you are as, as, la, as little as the Gambia with less than even 1 or 2%, you are not serious. But with, with the COVID, our GDP has gone down drastically. So the next president will seriously have a problem in terms of where you're going to get the money to, to put into, into yeah, the Yeah, well, production. that's what you asked me. I said there will be need to help the economy recover. And you will produce, you have to produce a plan to, to, to effect that, sure, sure, okay. sure. But right. quickly, can I have the response to the housing crisis, the land crisis? Uh, well, that's another major social problem, uh, the, the housing part of it. Um, this is partly because of the chaotic urbanization uh, to which this country has been subjected, uh, because of uh, the collapse of the rural economy, mainly uh, livestock, fisheries, farming, a lot of people move down to where they thought they could get employment. And they come and the, 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 the facilities are not there, housing including, housing included. So they settle in the most uh, chaotic manner. You, you just need to go through some of the uh, peri-urban areas, Joswang, Bundung, and see conditions under which people have been made to live. The environment is just so, so terrible. Uh, it's because of the housing stock is far short of the demand. The private, in fact, the government, the public sector itself is doing very little, except for the small schemes that Social Security and Housing Finance Corporation did. There's no public that, uh, that's housing not, uh, cheap housing. Uh, I don't know, but they're not even considering quality now. But anyway, that's at least an effort that on the public sector. But the, the other part, you know, is the private individuals who are doing their very best. Gambians have shown considerable resilience in spite of all the difficulties they have known. You go through these areas, you see a lot of uh, constructions. But the sad part of it is that the government, the state's own input in terms of infrastructure, electricity, um, internet, water, they are not there. The roads are not there. So it's very sad. So uh, that, that, that is the chaotic kind of organization which has accentuated the housing problems. Now, the land problem, as I understand it, is a slightly different matter. Well, it's related to, because 
the land problem is mainly in the same uh, western tip of the country where the population has come. Pressure has been built up because of the demand. And uh, unfortunately, there is a traditional land tenure system which has proved itself very vulnerable, uh, whereby land which uh, in the traditional uh, system held by the communities for farming purposes, uh, uh, those people, the owners were lured by offer of money to, to part with them in a most chaotic manner. Uh, and is now subject of great uh, uh, tension and feud, which is in itself is a is a big not only political but even a public order issue. If you listen to the communities around the around this area, uh, these are very sad, unfortunately. Uh, as I, but as I said, I would analyze them as distinct from the cost of living issue, which I, which, which the first question asked. But it's well, very we've sad. seen a land commission has been set up, mm -hmm. but we've seen very little that they've done. Well, I've heard about this land commission. Honestly, I don't know. I'm not very familiar with their terms of reference. I don't know. But like you said, I have also not seen any impact since they were set up. But certainly, um, the, this government and any government should not sweep this under the carpet. This is a, an explosive situation. Uh, uh, and I think the government should like, really take a comprehensive look. First, stop the, the, the what is going on now, because, and it's still continuing. When you hear of uh, land being taken and given to members of parliament, in other words, uh, leaders, the leadership of the country, uh, you know, from the people of Yundum and the Quirling, I mean, those things to stop until we sort out, work out a system which is equitable, fair, and, and sustainable. Uh, I, I need the government is not doing that again. Yeah, and of course, all the other uh, communities in this area are in, in, in turmoil, in ferment. They are all angry. They are all angry because not that they them, their members themselves are totally without blame, but it's because the authorities didn't uh, provide a kind of a legal, f a legal framework within which land transactions uh, occurred. And you find I don't know how many they call themselves housing estates, housing, is it? Real estate companies. Real estate agents. You go and ask the people of Combodeno, what those people, they, they have another name for them. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Dabba, this now brings me to, to the education sector. The education sector, I mean. Yeah. What's your view on the current education system? Because you talk about the issue of employment and obviously skills comes into mind. I think it's one of the sectors which cause greatest concern uh, to, to, to me and to, to many people. Uh, we certainly have a dysfunctional education system, which is very sad. Uh, I think the problem started when demagogues politicized the provision of education services. They make it a political tool by rushing uh, to the detriment of quality to establish schools without necessarily getting the, uh, the resource they need in terms of teachers, in terms of software, in terms of other materials with which is a block of, uh, block of uh, school, school buildings can really become a, a learning place. What we have most places are just blocks of, uh, they call them schools, but really there is not much that is required to, for learning to take place to be made available. And that's the sad part, because as I said, the expansion was politically and electorally motivated. And it is very callous, because you are playing uh, as a demagogue, you are playing on the feelings of the, of the, of the ignorant, uh, ordinary people, and also com uh, compromising the future of their children and the future of the country. I mean, the, the output of our education system is pathetic, what's going on. Not only the quality is so so bad, but the curriculum itself is so skewed that uh, what little employment is available associated with tourism and other private construction. When you go visit the sites, and I have done it, you find people, technicians drawn from all the way, Niger, uh, yeah. Ghana, Senegal, and it's largely because our, our people don't have the skills. Some will justify and say, ah, Gambians don't want to manual work. It's not just, often they don't have the skills that it takes. And that goes back to the education system. 
so that is an extremely uh, worrisome state of affairs. Gambia for all would definitely like to see the education system revamped, starting with the curriculum. Also, make, make sure that the investment is put into the education system to make these classroom blocks into effective schools, not just black blocks where people go and then one or two teachers come, some unqualified. Even the main teacher training institution, you look at their, 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 their teaching uh, practice now, uh, I, I, I'm reliably told that now they take people, they call them, I think the old time is unqualified teachers, and those people now register with the teacher training college, and during the three months, three weeks uh, Christmas break, or and, and the three weeks Easter break, and the one or two months, they go to, that's when they have contact with the teachers. You can produce good, qual good quality teachers in that way. You have to be serious. You have to produce good quality teachers, pay them, and it therefore boils down all to investment, how much money you put into education. There was a famous plan uh, called, uh, agreed when I was Minister of Education in Bangkok, where countries, particularly developing countries, committed to spend as much as 25%, 30% of their budget in education. And we were very much uh, inching towards that. But of course now, not only that has come down, but this, there has been a, such a phenomenal uh, increase in the number of uh, it, 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 it's, it's the biggest crime that the dictatorship did here and it did it just for political purposes. Th thank you so much uh, Mr. Dabo. Well I'm afraid with that we, we come to the end of this program. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the State of Affairs program and we hope to have you in our subsequent editions as the election approaches. Thank you so much once again for coming on the program. Sadie thank you so much for being on the program. Well viewers with that we come to the end of this uh, edition of the State of Affairs program. Do join us next week. Until then Bye-bye.